and you've been around, it's been three essays, 80 multiple threads. So this is a big change. So I'm not, I don't know all the information I'm doing. The, I'm doing what I, I've looked at the practice test and I've come up with some stuff. And that's Lincoln and Tab. It's on Tab. Wait, I have a question. Yes. So there's like two DBQs and two essays? No, no. No, no. Two total essays. One DBQ, one essay. Oh, but then short IDs. And then like, and then like, yeah, like four glorified short IDs. Wait, I'll show you. Them. If you can do good short IDs, you can get those easy. I'm convinced of it. I really am. The only problem is you get no choices. So let's just hope we know. But. Well, I don't think they'll be hard at all. I really <laughs> don't. We'll start doing examples of those applications. Okay. The question, there are basically four, well, technically they say eight, but there's only four types of questions that they're going to ask. And these four types, and I put them on this worksheet too, so that this is on here. Causation, just cause and effect, what we've done, your basic essay. The next one is comparison. And that's, you know, I showed you that evaluate, evaluate the statement. That's basically a comparison. We have to take one thing and decide if it's that or something else. That is comparison. And comparisons are the most likely one to have. And they're very similar to causation. Comparison are good because you can write about two different things. You don't need to know all about one thing. Continuity, they might ask something how something changed. A good example of that would be is how reconstruction changed. We'll get to that next week. Or the events, how did, how did it go from being a union to civil war? Another good example of change would be how British policy in 1763 changed and American acts and changed in the rest of the Revolution, Revolutionary War. In reality, this is very much like that. It's very much the same thing. And lastly, they might do something called periodization, I hate that word. Where they, I don't know, for sure. Mr. Carter yelling down the hall, of course he hears me. You might have to say something like reconstruction to civil rights in the 1960s. Or the events leading up to the Revolutionary War for the events of the Civil War. They might have something like that. I don't think it'll be that broad. I think anything there'll be will be more just like this. But I'm just giving you an example of that. And by the way, they did that. If you get over the initial, ooh, that's two different eras. It's actually fairly easy. Because you don't, it's not like you know basic information about both. You can write an essay. It's just think of it in terms of I don't need as much comprehensive information. And yes, read the question carefully, make sure you get what they're trying to answer, figure it out. Now you have not looked at the documents yet. Read the question first, and then do your, oh, I like this cartoon, so I gave you a Calvin and Hobbes. Mm -hmm. oh. You can try it. I have my work. I don't know. So, brainstorm. That's a great movie. This plan. Right. See? We'll have to go back. Brain. <laughs> Start thinking of brainstorm list, 10 to 15 things. I'm not a chance to look at all your brainstorm lists. I, I just started your query <laughs> grading your essays from yesterday. Look pretty good. Get as much things down about that error as you can. And when I think 10 to the pieces, start kind of thinking how you're going to break it up. But you haven't read the documents yet. Get as much information as you can get on your own. Because you have to add your outside information. And yes, do Calvin and Hobbes. Um, this Planet Earth, it's from the 50s. Oh, it's, one of, it's one of those really bad sci-fi movies from the 50s. It's so awful that it's great. Invasion of the Body Snatch. The Invasion of the Body Snatch is actually really good. This is so awful. Have you seen the War of the Worlds from that era? Yeah. Do you know all Harry Potter though? I think you would post on streams. It's pretty lame. In your essay, you must have outside information, historical information. It can't just be from the documents. So that's why you need the brainstorm. You have to be thinking as you write that I need my own information. So if the question is about the issue leading up to the Civil War, you need your own information. It has to be in the essay. 
This is called outside information or historical information. Each paragraph has got to have something. But remember, we did that hip historical information you know, on the documents, which I'll get back to you tomorrow too. If you have that, you got your outside information. If you can read the document to a specific fact going on, then you're in really good shape. And so, after you think about your outside information, that when your brainstorm list, you have an idea where you're going with your essay, that is when you begin to read the documents. You read the documents and think of it in these terms. They're going to give you seven documents because that's the way it is right now. <laughs> the way they're changing, I, never, I don't know. Seven documents. Of these seven documents, you must use all or all but one. They've got to be in your essay. So think of it this way. If you have to use six documents, that's about two documents per two documents that you must analyze and relate to the thesis per paragraph. There's no uh, this no. But the previous AP exam used to have one document that wouldn't work at all. It wasn't full yet. As I understand, all the documents, some might be better than others, but all the documents are in. Yeah. And we have to analyze all the documents we use. It's not like you reference documents, but you have to only yeah. analyze them. Every document ha you have to analyze or relate it back to the thesis. And you got to be, okay, I hate acronyms, but it's so awful and annoying. That might be a good way to remember. Yeah, the HIPPO. You have to use one of these four things historical information, intended audience, point of view, and purpose. One of these have got to be in your analysis for every document. One of them. They all relate. To me, point of view and historical context are the easiest. But all of them have to be in there. All of them. Or, I'm sorry. You have to have at least one of these in all the documents you use. At least one in all the documents you use. Is that more clear? Does everyone, you have to use all four, just one of them. And they provide the analysis. They provide the analysis. You have to relate it back to your thesis. But think of it this way. You already have a part of your thesis in your topic sentence. So just relate it back to that topic sentence, you're OK. Does that make sense to everybody? Relate it back to that topic sentence. Yes. Use them all. Or the more informa outside information, the more points you get. No doubt about it. The more outside information, the more points you'll get. And once again, kind of like a mini short ID, where you have one or two sentences explaining how the document is, and then one or two sentences relating. So each paragraph will have eight sentences, nine. What? So remember hip, we've already gone, and by the way, that's my two examples of hip. See, bongos, they're hip. And Raleigh fingers. Yeah, Raleigh fingers mustache, that's hip, right? So these are things we've already talked about in class. We've already done hip. Have one of these per document. I think this is the easiest, a specific thing to me, just the way I think. But it's in its audience where it's good, or the purpose, they're very close. Aren't they? These are very close. Point of view, just think in terms of this person believes this because they're this. So we've already gone through that. But here's an example. This is, I gave a document E. Why? Why not? So this is Lincoln talking to Democrats. Remember, he's a Republican. These are Democrats that stay loyal to the Union. He's talking to them. So Read the speech real quick. It doesn't tell you a proclamation, but you should know. He's actually not speaking in protest. What proclamation? Very good. That's the Emancipation Proclamation, which did not free the slaves only free the slaves in Confederate areas, but it symbolically turned the war into war for liberty. A lot of Democrats were very upset about this. And so he's trying to say, hey, think of it this way. If we free the slaves and they fight for the Union, won't they get what you want? Union? I think that, like, where's the North as far as Democrats? Like, the, like, at this period, like, what do you mean? Are they like the conservative Democrats or are they more like the They're all, they're, they're in some ways very liberal. They're, 
Democratic Party is all over the place. The urban parties are really liberal, conservative in the countryside. But they still make up almost half the population. The no, Democratic Party is big. So here's an example using historical context. Can you read this? I put italics. It didn't quite show up as good as I hoped. A couple sentences. So there's my quick paraphrase of the document, right? And then here's my, and then the, it italicizes the historical context. It doesn't say Emancipation Proclamation in there, so that's it. And I added this historical context, slaves and areas controlled by the Confederacy. That's part of the Emancipation Proclamation. That's an example of historical context. And you notice what happened at the end? Docu. Do you have to yeah, underline it? I really want you to underline the doc. So you have what's that? Oh, this is what they're doing now. It used to be all the time I taught, it used to be part of the sentence, the period was here. But now they're showing it in two periods. I don't know why. You know, just have a period. I'm, I'm not going to worry too much about that. But whenever you use a document, make sure you have documentation. Let me give you a more examples. Here's intended audience. The italicized part is the intended audience. And that's my paraphrasing of the document underneath. Notice I used it for two sentences. At the end of those two sentences, there I documented. Purpose. They're very close, aren't they? In reality, all four are pretty close. And then lastly, point of view. He's president. He's got to preserve the union. So it makes sense he would be doing this. And by the way, that's historical information. That's historical information. You've done part of your... So for each document, you need one of those. The DBQM, you get will have seven documents. Signing your document, just make sure you have somewhere, doc A, founding fathers, a short paraphrase. You can also say, like a little brief explanation of the document if you're not sure, you want to make sure you get credit, but that also explains a little bit on who they are. Oh, I always wonder, um, when you have more than one sentence referring to the document? At the end of the sentence. So let's say you have two sentences referring to one document due at the end of the second sentence. Or you probably don't want any more than three sentences. But no. Helpful hints? From World War One. What do you want me? If it's called a laundry list, where you just are listing documents to make sure you get them in. And you're like, you know, blah, 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 document A, blah, 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 document B. No, you gotta make sure you have analysis. Analyze it, make sure they relate to the your thesis, no quotes, don't quote, don't quote. Quote is a red flag to the person grading it that you're just trying to fill space and you don't know what you're talking about. There's only one time you can use quote. Once in the essay, you can use a five word quote if it really fits, really fits, but it really better fits. No personal pronouns, write in the third person, write as fact, write as fact as much as you can, and show, okay, some documents are just better, so just make sure you show you this document clearly shows it's something about it. Right. But, last couple things then, you need to have contextualization. And this one, it's a very annoying way to my point of view, but it's historical context in a way, but you have to relate to the broader historical area, and at least once in the essay, you have to have this. So that means, for example, remember Common Sense by Thomas Paine? You must relate that to the American independence. That's, that's really all it is. Or the, how the Treaty of Paris related to the uh, British taxation. The events of the Revolutionary War. Here's another one. How the 14th Amendment related to Reconstruction. Just something to that effect showing that you can relate to a broader the broader era of all the big areas. And the last one, once in the essay, you need synthesis. How it relates to persons, places, or events, at least once. Like how the events around Reconstruction relate to the Civil Rights Act. Just show one time in the essay 
how you see how the question relates to something else. So like in the events leading the Civil War, you can relate to the Revolutionary War, or relate to the events that happened afterward, like Reconstruction, or the Civil Rights Era, or the English Civil War, we're going to go way back. By the way, those are union members of the striking garbage workers in Memphis, Tennessee, in 1968. Martin Luther King went down there to support the union strike, he was very much a union man, and Martin Luther King was assassinated there, supporting that strike. So thesis, one more thing about thesis, be practical. Construct the thesis that you can use the documents and what you know. You can sure fit them in there. If you get a question, you might think, well, I'm going to answer it this way. Before the documents fit someplace else, be practical. You make sure it works. And we already did these. So your outline, quick outline. So after you done, read the documents. Then make a quick outline. The topics, your documents, as much outside information as you can, some kind of transition. We've already done this, right? So this is not a big deal. And lastly, the body paragraph, six to nine sentences, something like that. By the way, I don't know why I put the missing link there, but I did. I, for some reason, that struck me as funny. It was this poor kid who was really hairy that they called him missing because they said he was like the missing link between apes. Oh. He was one of those awful circus shows at Barnum and, Barnum and Bailey, or the Barnum Brothers, P.T. Barnum. This is what they're going to give every essay. Every essay on the AP exam, this is what they say, they're going to have these directions. Almost everything I told you, a thesis statement, synthesis, contextualization, that's going to be there. I'm going to give you a copy of this. You can read through this on your own, but every one. It's just basically restating what, you, what I've already told you. It'll be there. They used to not do this. Now they do this. Go off the question and go off this basic thing. And lastly, this is the scoring guide. I'll give you a copy of this, but this is how they do it. Seven points, one for thesis, up to three for analysis uh, of evidence. I'm sorry. Up to three for analysis of historical evidence and supporting of arguments with the documents, and one point for historical evidence. So if you do a good job on offer analysis of all or all but one of the documents, you get three points. You add historical analysis, you get one point. Contextualization, broader historical theme, one point. Synthesis, to another era, another point. I will give you a copy. It's on this. It's on this worksheet. And I have the S on what do you have two? Watching. The last page on this is the scoring guide. It's right there. I will have a copy of this and I will I'll do this. I've listened. Um, first time I've ever done this, I'm gonna put this on there and then I'll have a uh, area for comments on that. I'll just give it to you. I'm gonna have back the other In a way this this is easier than they did in the past because it's a little more definite on what they want, but it's also someone's interpretation. So be very clear you use the document, be very clear in your documentation. Make sure you get credit. Make sure you analyze really, the documents and thesis as much outside information as you can get. Would you like to do a DBQ? When I say would you like to, you don't have a choice. We have to do one. And so why don't I give you one? You're going to do this first one at home. It'll be due tonight after school. I'm kidding, no. When will it be due? I'm actually going to give you until Tuesday. And the reason why is simple. On Tuesday, Monday, if you have any questions, or you come back after looking at it, and you're like, I have no idea what you're even talking about. Then I will answer your question. I'll give you an extra day to ask questions. You will turn in your organizational thing and brainstorm and there were nine. Are they still worth nine? No, now there were seven. It doesn't matter. So it's not like how you had to have like 
certain things, and that's how you got to like it. So yeah. I now it's it just now it just fits. Hmm? All right. One thing real quick. It's very basic. It gives you a little bit of background and that kind of stuff. But if you turn the page, you'll notice kind of the, the document we gave before it has a question for each document. I'm not saying you have to answer them. I just left them in there because like that one I gave you on Jackson. It helps you maybe just focus on what the essay is about. It's it's not one you have to answer. It just questions might help you focus on what the document is about. I just repeat myself so everyone understands. Okay. What does it do? Last thing. Who would like a copy of the PowerPoint I just gave? Would anybody? All right. I did make copies for everybody. If you want some, all right, I'll give it there. I didn't want to give it to you until I was done. Hold on to these things. When we actually write an essay, the next time we do a DB field class, I'll let you pass this stuff out. For the first, you know, first time. Don't forget to hit it. God, that's annoying. Okay, it's going to take out your notes. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk a little bit about 1862. I'm going to hand back the test. Okay, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to hand back the test. The score is out of 80 on the Scantron. Just look at it and put it away because somebody didn't bother to ask yesterday. I know. He was like, it's not here. And I was like, where are you? Like, no. I put it right there. And then oh, like, Mr. Sam. Okay, so let's write down 1862 in your notes. I totally believe you. One of the things funny about you is it's Mr. Sims and I are our friends, and I think he just, huh? Well, I'm not, I'm not that one, but I think he kind of thinks that uh, I know what he does. You know what I mean? I know what Partridge does. Did we get to this? That became the ultimate plan, the Anaconda plan. And the Anaconda plan was... I know, I know, that's what I want. That would be the ultimate northern plan after the Battle of Bull Run. Once they realized that the war was going to be a long one, the Anaconda Plan was originally started by Scott, and it was called an Anaconda Plan because, sorry, did I kick you? No. Can I kick you? <laughs> <laughs> Which is your bad knee? Uh, what? Is that one? Why are you telling that? I'm sorry. It's a brace on it. I bet I can. I bet I can brace. It's out of 80. It's out of 80. It's out of 80. What happened to that? All right. So the plan was the Anaconda plan would be a blockade of the South. And that's why they call the blockade like a straw, a straw, or a slow strangulation of the South. They're going to slowly strangle the South through a blockade. But it really won't take effect until 1862. That's why King Kong diplomacy was such a failure. And then the other part of the plan was this. Take Richmond, knock out the capital, Richmond's right here, and the Mississippi. Get the Mississippi. I love this cartoon because it has a little caricatures for the... Uh, for all the states. <laughs> the new Union commander, the, oh, one more thing. That is the Confederate flag. That is the flag of the Confederacy, the stars and the bars. Do you see a problem with the stars and the bars? From a distance at a battlefield, what does it look like? Like the US flag. 
PGT Beauregard, the commander at Bull Run, Davis hated him, came up with a new flag just for the Army. It's called the Confederate Battle Flag. And that's the Confederate Battle Flag. Pierre Fort Marcy. Hmm? Pierre Gustave. Pierre Goussaint Toulon Beauregard. PGT. You know, so it's only a square. They were so short of cloth of any kind of manufactured goods that they made them squares. Because think about a rectangular flag like that. That US flag there is a Civil War flag. It takes a third, of left, third as much cloth, therefore you save cloth. Give you an idea how material, how short of material is they were. This is not the flag of the Confederacy. It is their battle flag, and it's an X so you can compare. So people say the Confederate flag. Well, actually, the stars and bars. It's not just the battle flag. Hmm? It really wasn't that big of a deal to the 1950s, and then this flag made a reemergence because it was anti-civil rights, anti-equal rights. And so, like for example, southern states started putting this in their flag. South Carolina started flying the Confederate battle flag from their state capital because it's anti-equal rights. Yeah, it, it's. And a lot of these kind of weird, uh, I can go on. That is the new commander of the Union Army, George McClellan. McClellan was a very competent general. He built a fantastic army, well trained, well equipped. In fact, by, by the fall of 1862 or 1861, he would have over 100,000 men. They called him Young Napoleon for his organizational skills. He was very arrogant. He really did believe he was that good. And his army would be called the Army of the Potomac. And so there are two armies that we kind of need to know. The Army of the Potomac was the Union one. There are other armies, Army of Virginia, Army of the Mississippi, Army of the Cumberland, Army of the James. But the Army of the Potomac was the most famous. And that is a picture of soldiers of the Army of the Potomac, a little bigger than this. And I love this picture. You get an idea how they're uniformed? They have their, now they're rifled, but still muzzle-loaded weapons like the one I showed you before. And navy blue top, royal blue bottom. Must have been really comfortable in Virginia. And here's my favorite part. My height. He looks about three foot two. And his mustache is about a foot long. That is a good mustache. But McClellan built this great army and didn't do anything with it. Lincoln could not convince him to move. Here is Northern Virginia in 1862. I like this map. Why do I like this map? Arrows. Arrows. I'm comforted by math with arrows. I'm allowed to sleep at night. Wow. Here's Washington, D.C. Here's Richmond. Richmond's the capital of the Confederacy. They're really close. It's an hour's drive from Washington to Richmond today. Well, no, I don't. It's about a four hour drive because of the traffic. But if there's no traffic, it's less than an hour drive. And all these battlefields have to be within walking distance of these two cities. So if you go to this area, it's hollow ground. This is the most hollow ground in the United States. And that's where Manassas was, the first battle. They were advancing down the railroad. Because of the rivers, there wasn't a railroad connection here. Well, John's, uh, the Confederate Army is right here, and McClellan refused to move all winter. It's almost, they called it the Siege of Washington. So going in 1862, <coughs> the Confederate commander was Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston was a beloved general, great in defense, considered to be one of the most competent generals of the Civil War, probably the most popular Confederate general of the entire war, and very good at defense, very cautious, a lot like McClellan. And his army was right here. McClellan refused to move. Before McClellan did anything, and Lincoln is begging him to go, McClellan sent out spies. Now, there was no real military intelligence.
So McClellan used to be the president of a railroad before the war. So he used spies that he used. They also broke up labor unions and guarded trains. They were called Pinkertons. Have you ever heard of the pink term, term Pinkertons? Pinkertons, they take the first private detective agency. Basically what they were is guys who guarded the trains. They guarded the trains. Well, they had no idea what they're doing. But by the way, that's their symbol for the private detective agency. Do you notice something about that? See the eye? We never sleep. Supposedly they're always on guard. What came out of this? Yeah. This isn't mine. What did I give you? I know that's not you. What did I give you? I have yours in my hand. <laughs> okay, it's, it's kind of tough hanging out. Did anyone have a holster? Well, you gave me mine already, and then you gave me another one. Why did you do that? Yeah. No. <laughs> you think it'd be easy? It's a lot harder than you think. Multitasking actually does not happen. What came out of this term? <laughs> <laughs> What's another name for private detective? Private eye. private eye. That's where the eye comes from. It's the eye. For well, the Pinkertons have Illuminati. The Pinkertons have no idea what they're doing. I'll get yours. The Pinkertons have no idea what they're doing. None. They tramped around Northern Virginia. A bunch of guys, mostly from Chicago. Think about it. Hey, how big is the army of the Confederacy? I mean, they were clowns. McClellan could not have picked worse. And what did the Confederates do? The Confederates realized these guys are spies. What did they tell them? Johnson had maybe 50,000 men, but they told them, oh, we have hundreds of thousands. Reinforcements are coming every day. And the Pinkertons went back to McClellan and told them they have between 150 and 200,000 troops. There's no way the Confederacy could have more men. Lincoln tried to convince him, but McClellan got this, and what did he believe? I'm outnumbered, two to one. I'm the only thing saving this country from massive Confederate hordes. Remember, the Confederate population was way too small. They couldn't have more. This is illogical, but he believed it. And McClellan, who was already cautious, would become even more cautious. But, oh, we done with the gun? What happened was, before anything had happened, Johnston literally was running out of food, pulled back the here. And when he pulled back, McClellan entered these Confederate defenses. And the Confederate defenses outside of Washington, D.C. were trenches, with cannon. It looked like it was a powerful fortification. Well, this is what they found. <laughs> what are the cannon? Logs that are painted black when they stick out. Here's another one. This guy's faking like he's firing it. They call them Quaker guns. Get it? Quakers are peaceful. Now. If the Confederates have to use fake guns, what does that tell you about the Confederates? They don't but what did they tell McClellan? They're even stronger than I thought. And they're trying to suck me in for an ambush. Actually, Lincoln made him overall commander of all Union forces. And when after this, Lincoln said, no, you just command the Army of Potomac. I'll command all Union forces, which was a mistake. And just attack. He finally did attack. Before we get to that, this is the Shenandoah Valley right here. The Confederates sent a really small army under Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. He marched up and down the valley, defeating armies two or three times bigger. Stonewall Jackson's reputation will become huge after these battles in the, in the Shenandoah Valley. Just the name Stonewall. Remember, he got that name at Manassas. And this terrified Lincoln. And that's when he said, you have to attack. And finally, McClellan came up with a plan. McClellan took, actually, it's a good plan, most of his men, about 80,000, and began what's called the Peninsula Campaign. The Peninsula Campaign. I'll explain those two things in just a second, but the Peninsula Campaign. 
It's a good plan. It's actually a really good plan. What else is this? I'll come back to the Merrimack and the Monument. He would use the Navy, U.S. Navy, sail down to here. There was already U.S. four here. Advance this way towards Richmond on this James Peninsula. Defeat Johnson's army right there. But here, the Confederates were working on a new type of ship. They took an old U.S. Navy vessel called the Merrimack, which actually the U.S. they burned and tried to sink it. They brought up the hull covered it with iron, and made what's called the Merrimack. This is a wood cutting of the Merrimack. It's got iron sides, guns in the, on each side, starboard, starboard and port, and then a gun in front. It's underpowered, it leaked, but cannonballs could not penetrate that iron. The U.S. heard about it, and they countered with this ship called the Monitor. Iron, armor. But what's that? You ever heard of a turret? Like a tank turret? It's the first ship with a turret. It turned. So the guns could be on this turret and it could turn. Yeah. So there'd be almost nothing to hit. In a way, it's a good idea. Almost all modern ships would be based on this eventually. Weird to think about a big hunk of iron. How did it float? What well, barely floated? They barely made it down. They would fight a battle. It would be relatively inconclusive. The Merrimack would go back into its base and then never come out again. The engine was so bad. But here's why this is so important. Everything, every single navy in the world was obsolete after they built these ships. Regular cannonballs couldn't penetrate them. They just bounced off. No one could sink these things. But it also showed one more thing. And this is what we have to get. Industry. This shows the industrialization of war. For the first time in history, Industry became almost as important as the men fight, almost as important as the tactics. In the 20th century, industrial and tech, industry and technology will be more important. Will be more important. The United States' biggest contribution to World War II was its powerful industry. Industrial mining technology. Heck, that's what makes our army impressive today. If you know anything about what happened in Iraq or Afghanistan, we did a lot of stupid things. But we had technology, which saved, well, at least some. And the Merrimack, or the monitor, they started making a bunch of monitors. The, the South tried to make a few more like the Merrimack, but they just didn't have the industry. The monitor would sink off the coast of North Carolina. I think you can probably guess why. It got caught in a storm. So low in the water. Um, yeah, okay. What was the point of having the boats if you got to keep trade? Well, the idea was now, if you're you wherever the boat is at, you can turn it and fire again. Okay, but was it designed to sink? Well, they hoped that the, they had a big, really powerful cannon, the two cannons, and they hoped they were big enough. As it turned out, they weren't quite big enough. They could damage it, but not sink it. But that wouldn't be the only thing they'd be fighting. Wouldn't ships do? Well, the, they would do a submarine. They'd try in Charleston, making some super great down. So, here is the peninsula. Then. This is a pretty historic peninsula. That's Jamestown. Remember that in 1607, the first British colony? That's Yorktown. The uh, last battle of the Revolutionary War. The Confederates built trench lines right here with slaves dug in form. If you go there today, this whole area is. This, all this, is one big historical park. Yeah. And McClellan landed here in the middle of March, and it took him nearly a month to move his 80,000 men about 10 miles. This is slow. How is that even possible? Yeah, it's like the right here were Confederate trenches. And McClellan was convinced that how many men manned those trenches? About 100,000. There were less than 10,000 troops there. Yet they, McClellan stayed here for a month, refused to attack 10,000 men. The commander, you don't even know his name, it's like Magruder. Magruder did a great job absolutely fooling the, the Union Army. He did all kinds of things to make him look like he had more men. He wasn't a good general, but he's a good thespian. This is my favorite. 
what he did is he had individual men hold up a pole with a board across it, and then they nailed rifles to the board with bayonets. They had trenches that were about 10 feet deep. And so they would walk in the trench line with this pole and walk <laughs> back and forth. So what did it look like? Yeah, and they marched back and forth. Like, oh, he must have so many men. He had a train pull into Yorktown Station. Just an engine, a locomotive, and it'd pull in and then billow off the steam so they could see the steam. And then they'd scream out orders for imaginary troops getting off the train. Like there's reinforcements coming, then they back the train up and then do it again. McClellan believed it. Even for a whole month, they sat there and McClellan slowly brought up siege weapons. These are big, heavy mortars that actually mounted in, they lob shells. That's actual Union soldiers at the peninsula playing dominoes, waiting to attack. For a whole month, that allowed Johnston to get down there. And what happened? What he's supposed to happen? Just when McClellan finally decided to attack. Reinforcements actually share that. No. They just pulled back. And pulled back. But it still almost worked. By May 31st, I'm gonna skip a couple things. By May 31st, Johnston had his army here, but they're riding the gates of Richmond. It looked like as slow as McClellan was, his plan was gonna work. McClellan had almost 90,000 men outside of Richmond, doubling, doubling Johnston's numbers. And that's where we're coming to the first real big battle in the East, a confusing, disastrous affair called Fair Oaks or Seven Pines. Fair Oaks, what I always call it, May 31st, 1862, the Battle of Fair Oaks. The Confederates counterattacked. Armies got lost. No one had ever commanded armies this big. There were parts in the battle. This at Fair Oaks was uh, based with this little tiny railroad junction that they were less than 30 feet apart firing it into each other's faces. The casualties were atrocious. There was no clear winner because it was just a confusing mess. But there were 12,000 casualties, slightly more Confederate than you. A bloody affair. One of the casualties was Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston took a mini ball, which is a name for the type of muskets, the Minet, the French inventor, so Americans call it the mini. Get him right here, right on the right hip. Lodged in there, they couldn't get it out. He lived. He'd be bedridden for six months. He'd come back and command. But using the terminology of the day, it leaked. I think you probably guess what it's leaking. Yeah. Oh. So did I get like my rules? Well, he would. He he had a, there were a lot of other issues with him. But he would die. They could get it out. Davis, Jefferson Davis, replaced Johnston with a man nobody wanted. It's weird to think about it today, but nobody wanted Robert E. Lee. The men looked at him and called him Old Granny Lee. They hated him because he made him dig trenches. They thought he was a horrible commander. They totally did not understand what kind of man Robert E. Lee was. And Lee, the first thing Lee did is he renamed the army. And that is the Confederate counterpart to the Army of the Northern Virginia. I'm sorry, the Army of the Potomac. It's the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee would command the Army of Northern Virginia for the rest of the war. He did not command all Confederate forces. Jefferson Davis did. Well, let me rephrase that. He would command them in the last uh, two months of the war. That was Lee's army. And Lee did the only thing Lee knew how to do. Attack. He counterattacked, knowing, he just seemed to know that McClellan was cautious. And if Lee counterattacked, what would McClellan believe? They got a million men. Yeah. Okay, so then we'll finish this tomorrow. This is, if you ever get a chance, go to these battlefields. Have you been to like any of the Civil War battlefields? I would. Gettysburg is the biggest. We do Gettysburg probably Monday. But Antietam's the bloodiest day. Who is the first time you can dress up now? Oh, 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 dress up day. I'll show you tomorrow. I'll show you tomorrow. I thought I would, you know. 
Uh, dress up day is going to be December 17th. That is a Wednesday. Who's the one person you dress up as? Calhoun. Who's the other one? We, okay, I'll let you dress up as Raoul too. And then. No, hold on. Oh, short IDs. I'm sorry to hand these out. Let me give it to you on your way out. Yeah, I just got to go. Tagger. Hannah. Taylor. Alex. Here. Brittany, no, I'll see you back in the I didn't know that. Wow. The number wrote down on the. Uh, yeah, on the. That's true. I need. Here. Jackson, don't hide. By the way, shorty, these are good. I think you guys are in pretty good shape, so we got to do more. Multiple choice. That makes sense. Michael, don't hide. I know you see your. Yeah, you never gave us an opportunity for bonuses. Yeah. I got totally answered. Yeah. Remind me again. The next one, okay? I'll do something for All right. I should have put you guys came in. What does he say? Oh. <laughs> oh, I just, um, what, what, um, he wanted to play with Ariana and that's why I like the idea of trying to come to the What can you love about all of a sudden? Okay. Hmm? Oh, the what's the result? Oh, okay. Remind me again, just remind me, I promise I'll make it up for you, okay? Oh, and Why? Oh, cool. Just remind me. We're, hey, that's actually really cool. The, the only thing about it is uh, you're, you're going to see a lot of things here to go. How does government function? <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun, though. I've lost two. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. We'll figure it out. Okay. Where do I have a test ready for you? Yeah, right there. I got to get on. Sims. Oh, what do you want? What don't I want? All right. We have people taking the test now, we, and we got bugs and hooligans. Sorry about that. Just give me one second. Right? Right. What did I do with that? I was just going to give you what I gave you. Oh, here. Just evaluate the following statement. Just read the part. Read that one. Okay. Read that one. Brainstorm outline thesis. You got three minutes. Go. <laughs> yeah, just making sure you're still good. Uh, it's all written. I just have it. Two. Oh no. Two copies. Right. Two copies and low side effects. Two separate analogs. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm putting them all in one folder. Okay, and then two separate notes, no problem. Yeah. And then inside the back I can do that. All right. right. Remember that I can put it in my flat, two copies of one. Okay, so we'll link around. Right. I'll do something with my hands. Are you are you watching? I just just making sure you get. Yeah, I got to keep them on tap. I have to heat up my dental suit. So be right behind me. See, brains are just as many things like this.
Maybe not quite now, I'm sure it's gonna work. I'll be right back.
All done?